Yeah, because the youngsters are kings. So. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الأنبياء والمرسلين بالقاسم محمد وعلى معصومين الطيبين الطاهرين. Dear brothers, dear sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today it was the first day of the holy month of Muharram. It's Shabit it's the night of the second of Muharram. And I think we have to take, as I said yesterday, the opportunity to reform ourselves. And every day is a day of resolution to change something, to try to be a better person, to reach perfection, and to be a complete person. It's not only good for ourselves or for the society, but it's also good for the year after. When you think about the other world, after this word, you cannot even imagine what will happen inside the corridors on waiting for the day of a judgment. That is why this is crucial for us that every single day, if I don't want to say every hour or every minute, are counted and we have to use this time to invest for the day of a judgment. Life is divided into five stages. The first stage is before the womb. It's the time that we are asked by angels if we are and if we want to come in life in this world and to accept the duty and the responsibility to have a test in this life. After we got the authorization, we enter on the uh, stage of the dunya, this world. Of course, we are forgetting everything and we have to remember by reading the Quran and coming back to our fitrah to things, to our heart, as I said yesterday, in a different world. After the time of this dunya, we have the time of barzakh, which is between this world and the year after. Well, barzakh means a veil between the both worlds, and this is one of the most difficult time for people living in the Barzakh because we can listen but we cannot speak we can feel but we cannot express our feeling sometimes people that are still living in the world and visiting us while we are in the grave we scream and we beg to come again on earth at least one hour to speak to the people you lost, at least to tell them things that you forgot to tell them, or at least to do one single rak'at to ask istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the barzakh, there are many, I don't want to speak about barzakh today, it's not the subject, but just is an introduction to enter for the Muharram 
is to remember the people who passed away in our family, the neighbors, our friends, because they are listening and they are communicating with us, but we cannot hear them. And we have so many uh, stories of ulama and awliya that explained back in Najaf or in Qom and even in the Mashhad that they were going towards the cemetery of the ulama and they were hearing noises like someone screaming and they were asking for to their surrounding if they can hear this type of scream like a camel like a horse who is screaming and they said no and then they realize that was the soul of someone who just buried and was begging to come back or at least to speak to someone to um, try to ask forgiveness to what are the sins uh, it did in this world. That's amazing time that we have many sayings from the holy Imams saying that when, whenever you are very happy, visit the graves. And whenever you are very sad, visit the graves. Whenever you are very happy and you are visiting the graves, it will help you to come back to yourself to be more conscious and self-consciousness about your own life, your own soul and existence. And you're thinking that I am going to die like this person in front of me. And whenever you're very sad and depressed and hopeless, which is something haram to be hopeless. It's a big sin to be hopeless. We don't have hopelessness in Islam. Anyone who is depressed, he needs to go to a cemetery and his heart will be and will bring joy and happiness because you feel that there is hope, you're still living. Was someone back in Qom um, that he was, he was a, a student from the Hausa and he was always complaining about his life and his family because he didn't have that much uh, you know, financial uh, uh, support and uh, the life for the students or the house is difficult, basically, around the world. And uh, he was complaining all the time and the professor, he was explaining to me, his professor didn't say anything, not even one single hadith or Quran or anything. He said, I'm going to bring you somewhere and inshallah, when, whenever you come back to the place, you will uh, understand the message. And he brought him to an hospital for the people who has cancer, the last stage of cancer. And he was visiting those sick people. Some of them were very young, maybe they were 20, 15. And um, when he saw that, he just stopped to blame all, time, all the time his, his financial problems and his daily problems. And he started to do a Turakat's prayer and to asked to subhanahu wa ta'ala to help him to keep his health and to thanks to everything he has because the worst person on her is the one who is not grateful doesn't thanks Allah for what he has it always expect to have better than others and we have to know that it's good to compare ourselves but we have to compare in the, on the right way it means that whenever we want to compare ourselves in the materialistic way, we have to compare with the one who are lower than us. Is all the time we say, look at myself, if you look at the Bollywood movie or any type of uh, life of people who live in luxury, of course, when you compare it to, actually, I speak about myself, I compare it to my own life, I blame myself that why I don't have uh, the same type of car or the same type of life and we shouldn't do that we should come back to the reality it's just a dream it's just to entertain people not to take it seriously and we have to compare with people who are lower than us however 
the only time that we have to compare people who are better than us, this is on the spiritual point of view. The one who is Hafez al Quran, we have to take an example from that person. We have to learn from that person. Regardless of his faith, maybe he's, he's, he's a Sunni, maybe he's a Bakri, maybe he's other faith from under Islam. But he recites better than us the Quran, so we have to learn from him. Don't compare yourself with. Usually, human nature is like this. Always, when it comes for the materialistic point of view, we comparing always people who are richer than us. And when it comes for the spiritual point of view, we compare ourselves with who? With people who pray less than us, who are less religious, to just say to ourselves, "Mashallah to myself. Look at how I am. I pray better than my cousin or my brother. Look at this guy." Astaghfirullah, it has to be the opposite way. We have to compare ourselves with the people who are praying better than us, who are spending their time to do Salat al-Layl. They wake up in the night and they pray towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and cry during nights in secret without that he wants to show off or anything. Because to show off in religion is even worse than show off for money or anything else. Everything has to be sincere. It has to be in the way of whatever Allah SWT wants us to do. So today I try to prepare uh, a topic about namaz. But I said if I want to explain about prayer, I think there are many things to say, but I like to link it with Muharram. And um, inshallah, in later on during the other days or other nights of Muharram, I will focus on the events of Ashura, uh, the battle of Karbala, the events uh, before Ashura, inshallah, to explain in English how and uh, what is the uh, event, uh, what happened. But now let's focus on the importance of prayer and the reason why and the effects of prayer, why we need to pray and what is important to pray. Especially, we, we all believe that prayer is important. This is anyone as a Muslim or even non-Muslim, whenever we speak about praying, said, of course praying is important. This is what I do all the time. However, when you look at more deeply, you see that not everyone are very serious on praying. They pray sometime and sometime no. Depends. They think in themselves, well, I will do my prayers later on. But then they forgot that they missed the prayer and they just don't do it. Or sometime we know that prayer is important. But we prefer to stick on the mustahabat or doing the adha. However, when comes the time of the prayer, sometimes we don't do it. On the time of matam, uh, I saw from my own eyes in the com in some communities, uh, not here, not in this country, in uh, another country. And mashallah, they was doing adha and they was crying for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But it was a time of Fajr, and I saw maybe the, a minority went to a wudu and did a prayer. The majority continued to do the azal and didn't do much anything about the wajibats. And the, the day came, the sun came, and they still kept, went to their home and they forgot about the prayer. And I was very amazed that why we stick on the mustahabats but we're forgetting our wajibat. Prayer has to be started whenever you are young. As soon as you are not maybe less than nine years old, even six years old. It's a habit. Because more you grow up, difficult, more difficult will be to get a habit of praying and to get that habit to develop uh, to yourself, to be on time. That, that is why the, the good habit has to be um, developed from the young age. And this is crucial, like asking to any human being that we have to uh, 
brush your teeth. It's something which is natural. So praying is one of the things that someone has to do it naturally and he has to do it in a way that he will enjoy to do the prayer and concentrate in the prayer. In the Holy Quran, we have many, many, many verses insisting about establishing the prayer. Oqimu salah establishing the prayer. It's not just saying doing or performing the prayer, but it's like an establishment, like you building a house or something, a foundation that you are sitting and living on that foundation. It's like a pillar. And if you don't have this pillar, the hadith says, if you don't have this pillar, this pillar, you will not be considered someone who share the faith of the Ahlul Bayt. This is as serious as is. It's, it's someone who doesn't pray and refuse to pray cannot claim to be a lover of the Ahlul Bayt. And this is a very serious matter that we have to take in consideration, especially for the youth. As Salah, this is a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam. The prayer will bring down the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you pray, like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said that he brought a piece of a branch from a tree full of leaves. And he shaked that branch and he showed that the, the leaves falling down from that branch. And he, while he was showing to um, the, the companion around him, he said the prayer is exactly like this. The leaves are your sins. And whenever you pray, your sins being disappeared. And you don't anymore have the sins. Well, prayer has other things that also is going to be very long to speak about. But I can just tell you, prayer will protect you from fahsha, from munkar, from perversity or doing committing sins. And whenever you pray, it will give you protection. Someone was saying to Imam Jafar Sadiq, I am praying on time, but I don't know why I'm still doing sins. You just, I heard from Rasulullah that actually whenever we sin, we are protected from sins. And the answer of the Ma'asumin was that for now, maybe you continue to sin, but one day you will stop and you repent. So it's a protection long term speaking. It's not a straight away answer sometime. So it's a hikmah that someone who start to pray and pray on time and pray Especially to be on time is very important to ourselves to be to have this discipline to count the time I'm very amazed that whenever you go to any Muslim majority countries um, the one who share the faith of uh, Sunnism They are very 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 strict on the time of the prayer. This is for me something uh, amazing Whenever is a time, sometimes they even close their stores. A month ago I was in Morocco and I was very amazed that I was inside the store why uh, I wanted to buy an item from the store. And it was a time of Asr. They closed the door and said, no, we're not going to do the transaction now. Let me do my Salat and then I'll be back. And myself as a Shia. I was waiting for him to finish his salah, to buy the item after he was finishing the salah. So it means that we have the tools, but you have to use it. What it says you have to pray on time, we have to pray on time. There is no thing uh, to speak uh, against it. Also, we have to, to see that the one who are praying gives a hope. He gives to the people like an energy inside the heart. It's like 
you can try, well, I don't say to try, but you can compare yourself to, with the one who doesn't pray. The one who doesn't pray will tell you that whenever I feel bad and I don't pray, I still keep not praying, and I feel that my heart is all is, is gone. I'm half dead. I don't have any energy. I don't have any hope. But I tried to pray one time, just to try, and I felt like something, a light. And when the person pray regularly, at the end of the day, you will think that, mashallah, I feel that there is something. And any time I do the prayer, it's like I accomplish something. It's, it's inside the heart. It's very difficult to describe. That is why that pray is helping for the people who, are, who have a problem of hope. And we should pray any time, regardless of um, the situation. Even going back to the event of Karbala, speaking about the prayer, one of the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Abu Thumama, heard the Azan and said to Sayyidah Shuhada alayhi salam that it's time for prayer. And he says, May Allah bless you. This is right indeed. We have to do the prayer now. So his companion was telling to say to Shahada, this is time of prayer. And he was waiting for his companion to have this uh, reflect in order to remind the Ummah that regardless where you are, when it's time for prayer, even if you work in a company, you can ask your break time or your lunch time in a, in a way that it's a time for the Salat. And if you respect the prayer, respect yourself, first of all, respect the religion of Allah SWT, and regardless that you even do it on purpose or not, but you will realize that the people around you will even respect you more because you're respecting your own faith. And this is a prescription. And we cannot compromise about the prayer. Some people even they have a long, long travel. They pray inside the train, they pray inside the plane. It's something that we cannot compromise. And this is something that he was given to as a gift to the believers in order to communicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we speak about prayers which protects you for all kinds of sins. I just want to remind one small thing about insulting and using abusive language. Some people tell me that Ziyarat Ashura is a book full of insult, insulting the Muslim leaders, astaghfirullah. But they don't understand that sab means insult using abusive language is different than la'an. La'an I cannot translate la'an by curse. This is a Christian way of saying I'm cursing someone or I'm cursing this. Usually, la'an is to remove the mercy of Allah SWT to a believer. And that is why that insulting is different than cursing. Someone who insults is not considered as a believer anymore at the time of his insult and abusive language. It means that even if we insult shaitan, we insult the uh, idol or anything, even the worst things of person in the world is haram, full stop. We cannot insult anything or anyone. Abusive language is fully condemned by the Holy Prophet. Several times in the Hadith that I can just read some of them and he consider the people who insult that is the border of the room 
is like Halakha. He's someone who's destroyed. He's not even a human being. This is this uh, level of uh, the importance of not abusing or insulting. And now comes for the people who insult their parents. And maybe in our community it's not that bad. But some other non-Muslim people, maybe, they are insulting openly their mother, their father, in front of their friends, in front of their family, or in front of their own parents. And they don't understand that doing this is even worse than drinking alcohol. This is even worse than drinking alcohol. Because you're destroying your own identity. You're destroying your own faith. You're not going to be considered as, even as an animal. Because even animals, they don't insult their own parents. So that, that is why um, that when I said Islam is a religion of peace, a religion of love and compassion and sincerity, it's all because of this teaching that is for the well-being of the human being. It's teaching us how to be a perfect person. Well, sometimes it's too basic, or sometimes we think it's obvious. Well, we need to have a dhikr, a remembrance, to think all the time. Even myself, I'm not a immunet, I'm not a masum. Sometimes someone is not, maybe not even Muslim, he just says something and he makes me think, some simple thing. We always need to be and to have the remembrance. That's why. It's always it's mustahab to listen to the Quran the morning when you wake up you put a tape or a CD and the night the same it's just to remember all the time even if it might be so obvious and when we go back to insulting we speak about curse now the cursing is not an insult it's not an abusive language Insulting is asking Allah, as I said earlier, insulting, Allah, insulting someone, asking Allah, not insulting, astaghfirullah, uh, cursing someone, asking Allah to remove the mercy towards that person or that group or that any, anything, society or whatever. So, is a Quranic teaching. The Quran teaches us to curse. We cannot deny the, fi the, the fact that the Quran is telling us This is a verse from the Quran. This is a dua. The dua, we have dua telling and asking people to help them, to guide them. Yes, but also we ask for the people who are zalim, people who are abusively using a tactic to oppress the one who doesn't have any voice. And of course, the only response, because we don't have the force or the power to respond or reply, the only response is to ask Allah SWT to remove His mercy toward that person or that group of people or whatever. And this is why in the Ziyarat al-Ashura, we have the La'an, inside the ziyarat as a dua that we recite and this line is not because of some Yazidi people it's a teaching for us to teach us that I don't want to say it that way but one of a good position and the, maybe the proud to be proud of to be Shia is to be a Muslim. And I think Mashiach are all around the world always madlum. Um, and basically it has been all the time the same during the time of humanity. The people who loved his, their Lord and they worked for their Lord in sincerity. We can speak about the prophets or the imams. They were all oppressed by their own people. And the, war, and the worst is the one who has been the most oppressed is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah, 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 Allah. 
that's that's why that when we speak about cursing is crucial to understand is one of our belief to curse we cannot just stop someone to curse and to say lamb or to ask Allah to remove his mercy and this is a part even in the, in, in the namaz, in the prayer, in the dua sometimes we ask the one who is an oppressor regardless his faith his outfit or whatever we ask Allah to remove his mercy and the worst is the one that use the name of the religion such as Muawiyah or any other uh, people who tortured the Imams they used or even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu they used the name of religion and some of them they claim to be Amir al Mu'minin or representative of Amir al Mu'minin or Imam Hussein or any other representative. But they are doing zulm under that name for their own interest, for the interest of anything which is related to this word. And that is why that the message of Karbala is here to remind us that our religion has nothing to do with power or anything related to materialistic power or politics it's all related to the year after however if we follow the teaching of the Ahlul Bayt it implies that you will have a good life in this life at the same time you will prepare for the year after but your destination is not this world. That is why. Why should we? Why should we spend and invest time, money, energy, power for, a dis for, for this world? To try to do our best to have a power or to build empire under our name. What for? The day of the judgment you will be asked what you've done to this world. When you leave this world, your kids will, will be there and they will join you after. And they will ask you why you taught us this way. You don't need to worry about who is sitting down in the top and why not this or, or the other one or the other one and I'm spending your time because day of a judgment you will be asked by your own deed not by why you care about what happened indeed if someone is oppressed and asking you to get help you're here to help and, and there are certain limits that you can help but if someone is not asking you you first save yourself from that and because we enter on the second day of Muharram this is Shabe Duvumi Muharram Salawadwa Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Imam Hussain alayhi salam born when I heard the, the, the kids um, I, I was thinking that maybe if you can say a, a, a very loud salawat maybe <laughs> Imam Hussein alayhi salam when he born his grandfather was crying he was crying in a way that his own mother, the mother of Imam Hussein, Hazrat Zahra, Allah. was asking her father, Why are you crying, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, That I'm crying is because Imam Hussein السلام, and this child will be the base of our religion the people will mourn because of him and remembering 
the right path of the path of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So since Imam Hussein was born, it was clear that he was the leader of the Ummah. And he was someone that the community and the followers, the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt must take from that child. And the Prophet was reciting Adhan and Iqama in the years of the baby. And he was cherry, cherishing this child. And as you know, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, basically, I'm not this age, but usually grandfathers, when they see the grandchild, um, they cherish more than their own child. But for Imam Hussein alayhi salam, it's not because of this natural relationship they have as a human being. It's because he was protecting and cherishing the pillar of our religion, the leader of the Ummah. And he was explaining to us that this child is the one that everyone has to follow. Hussein is from me and he's from myself. We are one Noor, one light, one blood. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he lost his grandfather and his mother when he was the age of seven. He was kind of orphan. He was living with his father, Imam Ali alayhi salam, and they were living together. But inshallah, for the following session, I will speak more about the life of Imam Hussein and his work before the event of Karbala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين صلواته اللهم صل على محمد ولعنة الله على عذاهم ملونين أجمعين من يوم هذا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كلامه المجيد والفرقان الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الرسول بلغ ما أنزل إليك من ربك إن لم تفل فما بلغت رسالة صلوات بر محمد آپ کی خدمت میں سورہ مائدہ کی آیت کی تلاوت کا حشرہ فاصل کیا کل ولایت امیر المومنین علیہ السلام کے حوالے سے کچھ عرض کیا تھا کہ یہ دنیا جب علی علیہ السلام کی ولایت کو نہ سمجھ سکی تو یہاں تک مسئلہ پہنچا کے وجود امام زمان علیہ السلام کے لیے بھی شکوک و شبہات پیدا ہوئے اور ولی فقیح کو بھی نہ سمجھ سکے یہ آج کا مسئلہ نہیں ہے ستر سال پہلے قریباً آیت اللہ زنجانی برے سگیر کے دورے پہ آئے تھے اور وہ لاہور میں بھی آئے تھے اس وقت علامہ اقبال سے ملاقات ہوئی تو علامہ اقبال ایک عام شاعر نہیں تھا بہت بڑا فلسفی بھی تھا اور اس نے اسلام کا بھی فلسفہ پڑھا ہوا تھا اور ملا صدرہ جو ہمارے شیعہ مشتہدین میں سے بہت بڑا فلسفی گزرا ہے اور آج مغرب بھی اس کو والو کرتا ہے 
تو بہت متاثر تھے تو وہ علامہ اقبال نے ایک سوال اٹھایا کہ باقی تو ہم سمجھتے ہیں لیکن ہمیں بارویں امام کے وجود سمجھ میں نہیں آ رہا کہ ایک آپ یعنی انسان بارہ سو سال سے زندہ ہو اور غائب ہو تو مختصرا جو جواب بنتا ہے آیت اللہ زنجانی کا تو ان نے کہا کہ پہلے آپ گیارہ کی ولایت کو مانیں بار بار خود سمجھ میں آ جائے گا اگر علی کی ولایت کو ہی نہیں سمجھا تو پھر بارہواں کہاں سمجھ میں آئے گا بارہویں کے سمجھنے کے لیے ضروری ہے کہ آپ پہلے کو سمجھیں اسی لیے تو آپ زیارت میں پڑھتے ہیں نا کہ میں اے آئے میں اہل بیت میں پہلے پہ بھی مار رکھتا ہوں ایسے ہی جیسے یعنی بارہویں پہ بھی مار رکھتا ہوں یعنی اول پر بھی آخر پر بھی تو جب پہلے کو ہی نہیں سمجھیں گے تو بارواں سمجھ میں نہیں آئے گا تو اس لیے ضروری ہے اور اتنا اہم مسئلہ تو ہے نا کہ اللہ نے اتنی سخت یعنی جو زبان استعمال ہوئی ہے فما پلک ترسالت یعنی سب کچھ تو پہنچا دیا تھا کہا کہ کچھ بھی نہیں پہنچایا اگر یہ اعلان نہیں ہوا اتنی بہت ذمہ داری ہے اور دیکھیں کل بھی جو میں نے عرض کیا تھا کہ رسول کے درمیان اور امت کے درمیان جو سب سے اہم رشتہ بنتا ہے وہ ہے اعتماد کا ٹرسٹ کا اور رسالت کے پاس اگر دولت نہ ہو حکومت نہ ہو فوج نہ ہو اقتدار نہ ہو تو کوئی بات نہیں ہے کام چل جاتا ہے لیکن ایک چیز ضرور ہوتی ہے وہ ہے کردار یعنی اگر نبوت کے پاس کریکٹر جو چیز اہم ہوتی ہے وہ ہوتا ہے اور یہی تو وجہ ہے کہ جب رسول خدا نے کہا کہ اگر میں کہہ دوں کہ اس پہاڑ کے پیچھے لشکر تیار ہے تم پہ حملہ کرنے کے لیے تم مانو گے کہا کہ ہاں تو پلٹ کے پوچھا نا کیوں مانو گے تو انہوں نے یہی تو کہا کہ تم امین بھی ہو تم صادق بھی ہو ہم اپنی آنکھ پہ یقین نہیں رکھتے لیکن آپ کی آنکھ پر یقین رکھتے ہیں جو آپ دیکھ رہے ہیں وہی سچ ہے جو اور آپ کی زبان پہ یقین رکھتے ہیں اپنی پہ نہیں کیونکہ جو آپ کہہ رہے ہیں وہی سچ ہے جو ہم کہہ رہے ہیں وہ نہیں جو آپ سوچتے ہیں اور جو آپ بیان فرماتے ہیں اسی پہ ہم یقین رکھتے ہیں تو اسی لیے تو ہے نا جو انسان زبان کا سچا ہو قول کا سچا ہو اسی کو صادق کہتے ہیں جو عمل کا سچا ہو اسی کو امین کہتے ہیں اور شریعت کی زبان میں اسی کو اسمت کہتے ہیں سلوات بر محمد تو جب نبی کے پاس کیونکہ نبی خبر دیتا ہے نا اگر وہ اس کی بات صحیح نہ نکلے تو ایک بات اگر غلط نکلی تو باقی کا کیا ہوگا یہی ایک واقعہ ہوا نا حضرت عیسیٰ علیہ السلام کے ساتھ سلوات بر محمد کہ ایک آبادی سے گزر رہے تھے دیکھا کہ شادی ہو رہی ہے اور شادی میں اکثر لوگ خوشیاں مناتے ہیں تو آپ نے فرمایا کہ آج لوگ یہ خوش ہو رہے ہیں کل یہ ماتم منائیں گے اب یہ کہتے ہوئے گزر گئے اب یہ جملہ کسی عام آدمی کا تو نہیں تھا ایک نبی تھا ایک پیغمبر تھا تو کل کا دن جو ہوا تو وہاں نہ کوئی غم تھا نہ کوئی ماتم تھا وہی شاد مہنے وہی خوشیاں تو جو اشخاص ساتھ میں تھے صحابی ان میں سے ایک گیا اور کہا یا نبی اللہ آپ نے جو 
कल खबर सुनाई वो कि वहां पे गम होगा मातम होगा वो रोएंगे पीटेंगे अब तक वहां पे कोई गम के आसार नहीं है वहां तो खुशियां हो रही हैं अब एक खबर थी कहते कि चलो बाकी तो सच है एक ना हुई तो नहीं हजरत ईसा सलाम उठे और कहा कि आओ मेरे साथ क्योंकि बात एक खबर की नहीं है ना अगर एक खबर गलत हुई तो कयामत की खबरों पे कौन यकीन रखेगा मौत के बाद की खबरों पे कौन यकीन रखेगा अगर एक कल की बात एक दिन की बात सच्ची नहीं है तो मरने के बाद और आखरत की बात पे कौन यकीन रखेगा जनाब ईसा इस्लाम आए आए और वहां आके उनके बुजुर्गों से कहा कि जो रात लड़की बिहा के आई है मैं इजाजत चाहता हूं कि उससे कुछ बात कर लू वैसे तो नबी उम्मत का बाप होता है लेकिन फिर भी इजाजत मांगी और उन्होंने इजाजत दी और जनाब ईसा आए और कहा कि ऐ लड़की अपने बिस्तर से उठ के आ जा जब वो बिस्तर से उठी तो जनाब ईसा ने बिस्तर को उल्टा जब देखा तो एक सांप है जो अपने मुंह में दुम दबाए बैठा है तो हजरत ईसा ने कहा यह है मेरी खबर अब मसला यह है कि इस लड़की से पूछते हैं कि यहां पे ब्याह के आने के बाद आपने क्या किया तो उस लड़की ने जवाब दिया या ईसा क्योंकि मैं जब ब्याह के आई तो ये सारे लोग खुशी में थे और एक शख्स जो भूखा था उसने आके अल्लाह के नाम पे सदा दी कि मैं भूखा हूं कुछ खाना मुझे खिला दो अब मैंने देखा कि कोई उसकी तरफ तवज्जो देने वाला नहीं है अब मैं अपने बिस्तर से उठी और खाना लिया और उसको दिया तो यानी हजरत ने इस हजरत ईसा इस्लाम ने कहा यह है इसके मौत के टल जाने का सबब और यही तो था कि जनाब रसूल खुदा ने भी इर्शाद फरमाया असद का तो तदफल बला हतल मौत सदका जो है हर बला को टालता है हत्या की मौत को भी टाल देता है तो यह थी खबर तो यानी नबी की खबर दुरुस्त होती है हम नहीं समझ सकते हम नहीं देख सकते यही तो वजह है अगर नबी कहता है बैठ के पूछा जनाब रसूल खुदा ने के साहब से के बताएं आप मुफलिस किसे कहते हैं तो कहने लगे या रसुल्ला हम मुफलिस उसको कहते हैं जिसके पास पैसे ना हो खाने पीने के लिए ना हो रहने के लिए जगह ना हो वही मुफलिस है कहा कि वो मुफलिस नहीं है तो अब कहा कि या रसुल्ला फिर आप बताएं अल्लाह का रसूल बताए कि मुफलिस किसको कहते हैं अब हुजूर ने कहा कि मुफलिस वो है जो शख्स दूसरे को गाली देता है सब हैरान हो गए अब यह भी खबर है कि क्या यानी एक अमल का असर क्या होता है वो नबी बताए अब यकीन करना वही जो यानी ट्रस्ट की बात है आप यकीन करें ना जो नबी कहता है तो कहने लगे या रसुल्ला बताए कैसे कहते कि मुफलिस वो है जिसके पास कयामत के दिन कोई नेक अमल न हो और वो है वो शख्स है जो दूसरे को गाली देता है या रसुल्ला कैसे हुजूर ने समझाया कि जब एक शख्स दूसरे को गाली देता है तो गाली देने वाले के आम नेक अमल जो है उस शख्स शख्स की तरफ मुंतकिल हो जाते हैं जिसको ये गालियां देता है ये बड़ी गौर तरफ बार है और इसला हो सकती है अगर ये नुकता जहन में बैठ जाए तो जितनी गालियां देता रहेगा उसके आमाल नेक जो है ट्रांसफर होते जाएंगे उन लोगों की तरफ जिनको ये गालियां देता है जब गालियां देता रहता है गालियां देता रहता है इसके अमाल 
नेक ट्रांसफर होते रहते हैं फिर जब इसके नेक अमल ट्रांसफर हो जाते हैं तो अब क्या ट्रांसफर हो अब ट्रांसफर नेक अमल तो है ही नहीं फिर जिसको गालियां देता है उसके अमाल बद इसके नाम अमाल में लिखे जाते हैं अब देता रहे गालियां जिंदगी भर देता रहे नतीजा ये हुआ जो अपना नेक अमल है वो तो फौरन चला जाता है जो दूसरे ग्रह करते हैं उनके अमल अमाल बद अब इसके नाम यानी नाम अमल में आते हैं जब कयामत का दिन होगा ये चीखेगा शख्स कि या अल्लाह ये मैंने इतने नेक अमल किए इतनी नमाजें पढ़ी इतना सब कुछ किया रोजे रखे नेकियां की एक भी नहीं है और ये जो बुराइयां हैं मैंने तो की नहीं है तो फिर उसको कहा जाएगा ये जो तुम गालियां देते थे ना लोगों को तुम्हारे सारे नेक अमाल उस तरफ मुंतकिल हो गए और जब तुम्हारे अमाल नेक खत्म हो गए तो दूसरों के अमाल बद जो है तुम्हारे खाते में आ गए अब ये बात है ना कि इसका मतलब क्या था कहने का रसूल सल्लाम में यह फरमाना चाहते हैं कि देखो किसी को गालियां मत दो क्योंकि तुम्हारा ही नुकसान है अक्सर होता है ना हम गालियां देते हैं कि भाई मुझसे उसने बहुत बड़ी ज्यादती की है तो हंस के कहते हैं कि भाई मसला तो ये है ज्यादती भी तुम्हारी हो रही तुम तुम्हारे साथ हुई है और आम हाल नेक भी तुम्हारे जया हो रहे हैं इसीलिए तो हुक्म है कि सब्र से काम लो सब्र से मदद लो सब्र व सलाह यानी सब्र से और नमाज से मदद लो यानी जब आपके साथ ज्यादती हो तो सब्र करें और सब्र के अकसाम है एक सब्र वो है कि जब आपके साथ कोई जुल्म करे उस पर सब्र करें सब्र के साथ उसको बर्दाश्त करें यानी अपने हदूद में रहते हुए उसका मुकाबला करें और दूसरा सब्र है जब मासीत खुदा पर सब्र करें मिसाल के तौर पर लोग कहते हैं कि भाई इस मुआरे में मैं रहता हूं दाढ़ी रखना मेरे लिए मुश्किल है अब ये सब्र है कि लोग अच्छा नहीं समझते लेकिन तुम अल्लाह की खुशनुदी के लिए अहलबैत की खुशनुदी के लिए सब्र करते हुए यानी लोगों के तानो तशना पे सब्र करते हुए दाई रखते हैं तो ये भी सब्र है यानी मासियत खुदा लोग भले चाहे लेकिन क्योंकि ये दीन का हुक्म है तो हुक्म की बजा आवरी यानी विलायत अमीर उलमोमिन का मकसद भी यही है इसीलिए तो है कि सबसे मुश्किल काम जो है वो विलायत को मानना है इसीलिए लोगों ने कहा कि हम अल्लाह को मानते हैं हम रसूल को मानते हैं लेकिन अली को वली नहीं मानेंगे और यही नहीं था यानी विलायत का ये जो हुक्म था वो वहां तक नहीं था जो एक लाख बीस हजार लोग मौजूद थे नहीं हुक्म ये था कि ये जो ऐलान विलायत है तुम सुन लो और तुम गवा रहो उस पर और तुम उन तक पहुंचाओ जो यहां मौजूद नहीं है अब इस लफ्ज जो मौजूद नहीं है दो मकसद हैं यानी एक जो मकानी तौर पर मौजूद नहीं है यानी आप जब इस गांव से आए हैं वहां पर हैं यहां पर नहीं है उनको बताएं और दूसरा है जमानी तौर पर यानी अभी तक पैदा नहीं हुए तो ये ए सिलसिला है यहां तक सुने यहां सुने और ये पैगाम लेके उन तक चले जाएं जो अपने घरों में बैठे हैं और फिर ये सिलसिला उन तक मुंतकिल होता रहे जो इस दुनिया में आते रहेंगे ये है विलायत अली अलीसलाम का फरमान कि जिसको हर्ष और जिसने न पहुंचाया उसने भी जुल्म किया क्योंकि यहां तक भी वो खयानत है अगर वहां तक तो बखर बखर किया आगे खुद मुंतर हो गया और कई लोगों ने ऐसे थे जब वक्त आया खिलाफत छिन गई और दूसरे ने कब्जा कर लिया तो मजमे में बैठते हुए कई लोगों को मौला ने कहा कि क्या तुम गदीर में मौजूद नहीं थे तो जिसने इनकार किया उस भी अजाब नाजिल हुआ तो विलायत अली अलात वसलाम का ही सारा मसला था और जब पहले को नहीं माना तो दूसरे की मानने की बात ही नहीं थी तो 
ہر ایک پہ ظلم ہوتا رہا اور یہ ایسے ہی تھا کہ جب اللہ نے رسول کے بعد بارہ ہادی بھیجے تو سوال یہ تھا نا کہ کیوں جلدی سے اللہ نے سب کو مطلب یہ حالات کی وجہ سے ان پہ وقت آیا کہ وہ چلے گئے اور آخری کو باقی رکھا تو اچھا مثال دیا کسی بزرگ عالم نے کہا کہ دیکھو یہاں میونسپل کمیٹی میں لو اسٹریٹ لائٹ میں بلب لگاتے ہیں نا کس لیے لگاتے ہیں کہ روشنی ہو لوگوں کو پتہ لگے رہنمائی ہو لیکن چند شریر نا سمجھ لوگ آ کے اس کو توڑ دیتے ہیں پھر کاؤنسل کیا کرتی ہے آ کے دوسرا لگا دیتی ہے پھر وہ توڑ دیتے ہیں تیسرا لگا دیتی ہے وہ انہوں نے جب لگاتے رہے اور یہ توڑتے رہے ایک دن کاؤنسل نے یہ فیصلہ کر لیا اب ہم نہیں لگائیں گے جب تک تم سدھر نہ جاؤ تو یہی ایک مثال ہے سمجھانے کے لیے کہ بارہویں کی غیبت کا ہی مت یہی ہے جب آپ کو رسول کے بعد ہادی علی جیسا ہادی ملا لوگوں نے شہید کر دیا امام حسن جیسا ہادی ملا لوگوں نے شہید کر دیا امام حسین جیسا ہادی ملا لوگوں نے شہید کر دیا حتیٰ کہ امام حسن عسکری علیہ السلام تک سب کے سب یا زہر سے شہید ہوئے یا تلوار سے شہید ہوئے تو بارویں کو اللہ نے محفوظ کر لیا تو ازادارہ نے حسین کربلا حقیقت میں جو جو شہید ہیں وہ ولایت کے شہید ہیں اور جب یہ کافلہ سے پہر دو محرم سے پہر کو جب کربلا کو پہنچا ہے تو امام حسین علیہ السلام کا گھوڑا زلجنا رک گیا تو امام نے اس کو آگے چلانے کے چلنے کو کہا لیکن گھوڑا نہ چلا تو امام حسین نے کہا گھوڑے کو تبدیل کر دو کوئی اور جانور لے آؤ دوسرا گھوڑا لایا گیا ایک قدم چلا ٹھوکر لگی رک گیا حتیٰ کے سات گھوڑے تبدیل کیے گئے امام تو جانتے تھے لیکن منشاء ایز دی تھی حکم نہیں تھا گھوڑوں کو ایک قدم آگے جائیں تو امام نے کہا کہ یہاں کے جو آس پاس کے لوگ ہیں ان کو بلاؤ اور وہ بنی اسد کے لوگ آئے مولا نے کہا کہ اس زمین کو آپ کیا کہتے ہو تو کہنے لگے مولا اس زمین کو ہم کہتے ہیں نئے نوا مولا نے کہا کوئی اور نام بھی ہے کہا کہ ہاں مولا اس کو غازریا بھی کہتے ہیں مولا نے کہا کوئی اور نام بھی ہے کہا کہ ہاں شت الفرات بھی کہتے ہیں مولا نے کہا اور نام نام لیتے گئے مولا نے کہا کوئی اور نام کہا کہ جتنے نام ہمیں یاد تھے ہم نے بتا دیے اور ہمیں یاد نہیں ہے کیا کوئی اور شخص ہے تمہارے قبیلے میں کہا کہ مولا ایک بڑا شخص ہے لیکن وہ چل نہیں سکتا مولا نے کہا اس کو بھی اٹھا کے لے آؤ وہ گئے اور اس بڑے شخص کو لے آئے مولا نے کہا کہ بتاؤ اس یہ جو نام بتاتے ہیں زمین کے کوئی اور نام بھی ہے تو کہنے لگا ہاں مولا اس کو ہم کرب و بلا بھی کہتے ہیں وہ اب ہم نہیں کہتے اس کو کرب و بلا کیوں کہا کہ یہ ہمارے بزرگ بتاتے ہیں کہ یہاں سے کوئی نبی نہیں گزرا جس کے جسم سے خون نہیں پہا کوئی نبی زیادہ یہاں سے نہیں گزرا جس جس نے یہاں ٹھوکر نہیں کھائی اس لیے ہم نے اس کو کربلا کہنا چھوڑ دیا تو مولا نے کہا کہ بس یہاں پہ خیمے لگائے جائیں اور ہم ہماری منزل یہی ہے اور امام علیہ السلام السلام نے کہا کہ بنی اسد کو کہ یہ جو زمین ہے کربلا کی یہ میں خریدنا چاہتا ہوں کہنے کے لیے ابن رسول اللہ آپ ہمارے مہمان ہیں آپ رہے آپ کیوں خریدتے ہیں زمین کو کہا کہ میں مہمان ہوتا ہے تین دن کا میرے یہاں قیامت تک رہنا اور امام حسین نے وہ جگہ وہ زمین کربلا خرید لی اور فرمایا کہ دیکھو جب کبھی میرے زائر یہاں پہ میری زیارت کو آئے تو ان کو تین دن ٹھہرانا ان کو کھانا پینا دینا 
अब ये है ना कि मौला इस वक्त ये वो वक्त था जब शीयों को याद कर रहा है अब दे मोहबान को याद कर रहा है कि जब मैं यहाँ से यहाँ पे शहीद हो जाऊंगा मेरी जियारत को आएंगे तो उनको तकलीफ ना हो जब वो आए तो उनको मेहमान रखना हाँ मौला ऐसा करेंगे फिर कहा कि अब एक और काम करना जब जब हम हम यहाँ पे शहीद हो जाए तो तुम मर्द आके हमारी लाशों को दफन कर देना हाँ मौला ऐसा करेंगे कहा कि अब जाओ तुम अपनी औरतों को बुला के ले आओ वो गए और हिजाब इस्लामी में वो सारी औरतें आई कहा कि अब रसूल बुला रहे हैं तो मौला ने उनको कहा कि देखो जब हम शहीद हो जाएं और तुम्हारे मर्द यजीद के लश्कर से घबरा कर घरों से ना निकले तो तुम पानी फ्राद से पानी लेने के बहाने आना और हमारी लाशों को दफन कर देना हाँ मौला हम ऐसा ही करेंगे फिर कहा जाओ अपने छोटे छोटे बच्चों को ले आओ और जब वो बच्चे जमा हुए ना तो मौला ने कहा देखो जब हम शहीद हो जाए अगर तुम्हारे बुजुर्ग खौफ की वजह से ना निकल सके और तुम्हारी माए बहने खौफ की वजह से ना निकल सके तो तुम खेलने कूदने के बहाने से मैदान कर बना में आ जाना और तुम दफन तो नहीं कर सकोगे बस खा के कर बना मुठिया भर भर के हमारी लाश में डाल के हमें दफन कर देना तो यही पे एक जुमला कह दू ना मौला इमाम लाबीन मौला मौला हुसैन तो ये कह रहे थे कि बच्चों को भी कि मुठिया भर भर के मेरी लाश पे मिट्टी डाल देना ग्यारह मुहर्रम को जब आप जा रहे थे तो कम से कम दफन करने के हाल में नहीं थे तो मट्टी की मुठिया भर के ही मोला के लाश पे डालते तो मोला कहेगा ना मेरे गले में तो हाथ मेरे बंधे हुए थे मैं इतना आजाद भी नहीं था कि मट्टी की मुठ्ठी भर के मैं बाबा के लाश पे डालता उनके सही रहो कभी ना बुढ़ा माफ कर दे